Welcome to some. However, for those who didn't join us in part one, my name's Dave Humphrey and I ran a campaign in Cambridgeshire that uncovered the abuse of approaching a million pound of public and private funding. Now, because I was forced into being interviewed under caution when I spoke out about a prominent councillor during the FACT campaign, I wish to now make it clear we are plainly discussing Councillor Tierney's official conduct, so I released this report in the public's interests. And as with part one, I have put a link below to all evidence that supports what follows. So with introductions and declarations made, let's get straight into it. When Councillor Tierney's political behaviour is challenged, one of his defences is to accuse the challenges themselves of lying or twisting his words out of context. Therefore, what you're about to see comes direct from the defence document prepared by himself when the code of conduct complaint I was asked to assist in was brought against him. So what defence did he use against the alleged claim he makes false allegations to attack people's reputations, for example? Well, he quite simply denied making any. Instead, he demanded the evidence consi consisted of his personal opinions. Now, that's a distinction the average year eight school child can make, so immediately starts ringing alarm bells. So let's take a look. Well, as can be seen here, quite clearly, he accused the local editor of printing a pack of lies. Yet instead of supplying any evidence to validate his accusation, he defends himself with, my views about the local press are my own. Well, it is a pack of lies is a direct allegation, not a view. Here, he accuses the editor of breaching official guidance. Now, the IPSO confirmed no such press guidance exists. Obviously, then, no such legal or police guidance can also be found. So again, with no evidence available to support his allegations and apparently no desire to confess and apologise, once more it seems he fraudulently tries to pass off another direct allegation as an opinion. On page one of his defence, he implies his comments are his right to free speech. As discussed in part one, is this following attack not another projection of his own political behaviour onto what he regards as the usual suspects, when he demands Sharon appears to think that free speech means the right to cast dispersions on other people's businesses and reputation without any evidence to back it up? Is that not an exact description of what you've just witnessed? Now, over and over again, Councillor Tierney insisted innocence solely based on the apparent redefining of words within the English language. This then confirmed in his final conclusions found on the last page of his defence, when he demands, what they refer to as false allegations are simply personal opinions with which they disagree and are clearly shown as such. I believe it's quite clear this one sentence alone is literally filled with lies. They were not opinions, they were not clearly shown as such, and as, we'll now be, and as we will now see, they were not disagreed with, but some evidence to be false. You see, here, Councillor Tierney accuses editor John Elworthy of ever more blatant bias in favour of the united opposition. However, I personally investigated the paper's archives to produce the evidence of how only two of the preceding 26 Voice of the Fed features, 7.5%, mention what Councillor Tierney refers to as united opposition. Strange then how Conservative Councillor Tierney fails to comment as to the six posts, posts 23%, which included and gave praise to Conservative MP Steve Barclay. However, praise to Mr Barclay wasn't the only thing it seemed Councillor Tierney wished to ignore. You see, apparently unable to explain the physical evidence supplied, it looks as though this time he decided the best defence would be to simply ignore the evidence altogether and claim, I would point out that a personal opinion is not false just because Anna Lay and Paul Clapp say it is. Yet again, the word the proves it wasn't written as an opinion. And secondly, clearly it wasn't false just because Adam Lay and Paul Club say it is. It was false because the evidence supplied in the complaint proved it was false. Surely, simply refusing to acknowledge physical evidence even exists. It's a type of irrational dishonesty you would expect from a small child, not an elected official. I thought you maybe had a cupcake. No. No? And yet, it would seem, this was not a one-off. 
What of the alleged claim he makes offensive comments or insults people, for example? You're now watching float past some of his comments found in the evidence, comments it would appear he had to ignore to then claim the worst insult I would find in the evidence was silly and shenanigans. Surely just complete and utter nonsense. Well, how about this then, where he demands, I often make reference to using terms like usual suspects and local haters, and you will notice that nobody is named when I reference these groups. Here's the opening statement from his blog post, Letters from Mars. Enter as evidence, clearly referencing the usual suspects, then immediately names David Patrick. Or what about this blog post, also entered as evidence, where Bob Doherty is clearly accused of being part of a group of haters. Or here, where David Prestige is seemingly identified as a usual suspect and a generic hater. And on, and on, and on it goes. For example, on page 13, he defends one of his allegations by categorising it as a criticism of behaviour, which he then implies is necessary to a democracy. So, what then if the shoe is placed on the other foot? Well, here, people criticised the previous behaviour of his close friend for allegedly parking a van illegally in a dangerous position. Was this all respectfully regarded as all part of the way the opposition interact? It appears not. No, they apparently get called scumbags. And what happens when somebody criticised that behaviour? It seems they get accused of being a liar and a generic hater. And what happens when people use their legal right to protest against this kind of behaviour in, in a council meeting? They also get called a group of haters, belonging to a hate fest, and again, again accused of lying. Or if a member of the public publishes a petition against this type of, uh, type of behaviour, it appears she gets accused of being part of a mean and vindictive group, guilty of regular out outright lies, and being a third-rate playground bully. But what then happens if we begin to look a little closer at his justifications for such attacks? Well, let's examine just one of his so-called validations for the scumbag post, for example, where Councillor Tierney claims the picture was a lie in the first place. So what does he mean by this? Well, it seems the answer is found in his blog post, actually, where... Whilst trying, while denying his readers the opportunity to actually examine the picture, he declares, why this is incorrect spin? For a load of reasons. Because it's not illegal to park a van on double yellow lines for loading and unloading. Absolutely no relationship whatsoever to the evidence photo. I suspect perhaps why he refused to let his readers see it. So let's take another look. The van is illegally parked, it's in a dangerous position, forcing pedestrians into the road, and no loading or unloading taking place whatsoever. In fact, the pub has its own car park. So what about this picture? Or this one? Or even this one? Many believe for a councillor to use such language is unacceptable under any circumstances. However, has Councillor Tierney called members of the public scumbags, founded on nothing but false allegations, founded on outright lies? And how did he excuse himself this time? Well, he claimed he won't waste his time with it as he didn't name anybody. Now, in a defamation, defamation case, sorry, a high court only requires the person or persons to be identifiable by what was written. Apparently, something also confirmed by legal precedents recently used by the District Council themselves in another conduct complaint. And what then of his defence for calling members of the public liars when using their legal right to protest? He claims how he couldn't see any evidence where he had accused the public of lying. He therefore gives himself permission to simply ignore this claim. What you're looking at is the blog post that was the foundation of this specific issue. So. No spin, no twisting of words, no taking out of context. First, the evidence seems to prove how Councillor Tierney has in fact made false allegations when attacking people on his political blog. Second, unless Councillor Tierney is to claim his level of English is below that of a 13 year old and also give rational, rational explanations as to why he frequently made statements in direct conflict with the physical evidence then surely this also proves beyond all reasonable doubt he knowingly and repeatedly lied in his official capacity to pervert the outcome of an investigation against himself. A wrongdoing that it would seem is so serious in nature the Deputy Prime Minister was sacked for the same offence. 
Quite simply, I believe the evidence seems to clearly expose how all of Councillor Tierney's principal conclusions found on the final page of his official defence document were based on complete and utter fiction. All of them. So, taking all that into consideration, can we not again look at another of his attacks on the opposition for the possible truth when he demands it's an absolute pack of lies by the master of lies and anybody stupid enough to believe a word of it needs their head tested? Couldn't agree more, Councillor Tierney. Couldn't agree more. And a point I believe consolidated in his final statement when he declared, given even the lack of a shred of evidence, I'm sorry, I can't even keep a straight face. I'll go back, I'll go back to the beginning. Given a complete lack of even a shred of evidence which backs up the claims made, I believe this response document proves without doubt that the complaint is groundless. That's just incredible. The only thing that I believe it proves was his guilt. Seriously, who was Councillor Tierney expecting to fall with this stuff? Does he really think the public is that stupid? Now, some have claimed he was confident he'd get let off, to which I argue, then why write 41 pages? However, for now, arguably one of the most disturbing aspects of this case is our council officers unbelievably and i feel reasonable to say literally unbelievably dismissed this entire complaint on the grounds there existed no evidence that the code of conduct had been broken and this and other decisions i consider to be the fundamental reason as to why you are unaware of this councillor's seemingly immoral and dishonest official acts now, depending on what side of the fence he's standing on, it would seem even Councillor Tierney disagrees with the Councillor's decision. Here he is speaking of another opposition Councillor. To attack a business and an individual based on false assumptions, how about a little personal responsibility? Somebody should remind him that he signs the Council's Code of Conduct when he becomes a Councillor. Or perhaps giving his word doesn't mean very much. Who knows? You do, Councillor Tierney as now, I believe, does this audience. However, now apparently under the protection of that decision, things seem to get really unsavoury, as in my opinion, he once again brings the council into disrepute in the most distasteful way. You see, it appears Councillor Tierney wasn't happy with just getting away with his apparent lies, deception, false allegations and years of offensive online attacks. No, now it seems he feels the need to publicly mock the complainants, again attack the local editor and even demands how they owe him an apology. And then to, the, to then shamelessly question their integrity if they don't give it. And he apparently wonders why people don't like him. Seriously. Surely it's fair to ask, while acting in his, in his official capacity, does Councillor Tierney have any regard for integrity, honesty, in fact any moral compass or code of conduct whatsoever? And what then of all this as to the official positions he holds? You see, he's since been appointed to the Cabinet of the Fenton District Council as portfolio holder for transformation, communication and environment, sits on such committees such as Cambridgeshire Police and Crime Panel, and even since been chosen by the local Conservative Association to be their Vice Chairman. Oh, and just to top it off, remember the I don't name usual suspects nonsense from his defence? That didn't last long, did it? Honestly, I genuinely find it painful to watch some of these councillors. For years, Councillor Tierney has been publishing self-promoting claims as to his official persona. For example, here he claims, I always try to combine scrutiny and fair and objective comment with honesty and professionalism. I feel it's fair to say, hardly reminiscent of what we've witnessed so far, is it? Here he is speaking to the Cam's Times. I strive at all times to avoid rudeness, name-calling, swearing, lies and inaccuracies. So, based on what you've so far witnessed, let's quote from his blog post actually and ask what gives the truer representation of what we've just seen. His attacks on the opposition and generic haters of all sorts or his self-promoting descriptions of himself. The trouble, as ever, is that if I do not respond to the spin, falsehoods, deceptions and outright lies, then they go unchallenged and people believe them. 
I can't fix all of this. I can only do my bit to tell the actual truth as best I know it. <laughs> Seriously. In my personal opinion, it would seem a truer representation would be found by simply believing the exact opposite of what he wants us to believe, or by holding the mirror up to his attacks on others. However, with all of that being said, the one thing I personally believe cannot now be argued is when speaking in his official capacity, whether attacking people, talking of himself, reporting council business, or defending his official actions, nothing Councillor Tini says can ever blindly be believed again. Anyway, that's part two. Join us in part three, where we will scrutinise one of Councillor Tini's repeated public pleas of victim status, examine the evidence that appears to expose how it was also apparently based on complete fiction, and again, arguably mo motivated to publicly incite ill feeling. So, once again, like myself, if you believe others have the right for transparency, please tap the share button, a like would be appreciated, and please subscribe for any further updates. So, once again, until the next time, take care, stay safe, but most of all, try not to let the buggers get you down. Bye-bye. <laughs>